Um, both uh, Dr. Osborne Jelks and I are very, very happy to be with you all today um, and really focusing on uh, the health impacts of climate change and um, also talking about how actually working on mitigation will have direct um, improvements in health. So let me advance our slide. So the key points that we're really hoping um, to leave you with today is, are really so that if you are an ambassador for this information to those in your community, um, you'll be able to dispel certain myths and certain misconceptions. So the first key point is one that we all agree on, but I think it's very important to continue to um, express these very specific, simple key points to really bring it home, which is that climate change is real. It is us, it's bad. Scientists agree on this. And the most important point is that there is hope. We also hope to leave you with information that informs you about the specific risks to Georgia and to the rest of the world as it relates to climate change. And then to leave you with the hope that when we tackle these risks aggressively, we create real opportunities, not only for the economy and the environment, but almost immediately we'll see some health benefits. So our objectives today, we'll start off our presentation by describing at a high level, some of the specific health threats from pollution and climate change to the health of Georgians. In our second part, we will examine risks and health impacts on the most vulnerable Georgians and get really into the specifics of what we can expect or anticipate um, with regard to climate change and the health of Georgians. And then we'd like to leave the discussion with actions that we can take today that will both protect our health and address climate change. Really drawing off of Drawdown Georgia's 20 um, solutions. So I'm sure that everyone that has joined us today has an awareness of this, but I just thought that this is another good way to really inform people that ask, well, what's the rush? Can't we just do this slowly? Why don't we meet in the middle? Um, what's the big deal? So we know from the Paris Agreement, um, this was back in 2015, that the goal um, that the world community came up with was really to try to aim to keep global warming um, at an average of two degrees Celsius, uh, of less than two degrees Celsius, and as close to 1.5 degrees Celsius um, as possible to reduce significant risks and impacts on human health and human society. In 2018, um, it became even more urgent when the IPCC report came out and, and really showed that if we want to stave off the worst effects, we really want to stay as close to 1.5 degrees as uh, degree centigrade as possible, and that this really requires a 50% reduction um, compared to 2005 levels by 2030, so less than 10 years, and net then to get to net zero emissions by 2050. So really, there is urgency to action. And then another thing to show people frequently is that this isn't normal. So people will say, well, the levels have always gone up and down and it hasn't really affected health or all of these things that we're so concerned about. But I think this graph really brings home the point that yes, we have had variability in CO2 levels, but right now our curve is going straight up and we are having symptoms of extreme weather, um, severe heat waves and other symptoms. So in medicine, when you see this type of change and you have symptoms, you know that there's some urgency to act. Um, it, with regard to how bad it can get, um, we know that if we get significantly or scientists anticipate that getting significantly above 1.5 degrees Celsius, humans will face much more dangerous potential health impacts at two degrees of warming. Um, the an anticipation is that 1.7 billion more people would be exposed to severe heat waves once at least every five years um, compared to if we're able to stave off and, and remain closer to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And then we also are concerned about other irreversible effects 
that will have profound impacts on our cities and coastal communities. Um, so really, again, there is urgency and things could get worse. So now to speak a little bit more specifically about health effects. So I think it's really important as we talk about it is that we're not just talking about greenhouse gases causing health effects some, at some point distant in the future because of climate change. We're talking about the real effects that combustion of fossil fuels and other industrial activities have on health today and cause in terms of causing massive amounts of pollution that are that affect our health and certainly affect the health of fence line communities that are very close to the pollution but all of us as we as they say air um, you know wind blows and water flows and it will reach all of us these these pollutants so we know that toxic pollutants have a, can cause a whole range of health problems from lung and respiratory conditions like worsening lung function, causing bronchitis, causing COPD, asthma exacerbations, hospitalizations. And with COVID, we have data showing that the worse um, exposure to air pollution that a community has, the worse they do with regard to the complications from COVID. We also know that pollution, particularly air pollution, can cause conditions like heart attacks, arrhythmias, and congestive heart failure. And there's growing evidence about the impact on our brains and our nervous systems. So for example, strokes are elevated in people that live closer to um, air, sources of air pollution. And there are growing, um, there's a growing knowledge around Alzheimer's disease and impacts on cognition and dementia. So really to kind of think a little bit more specifically about what we are exposed to here in Georgia, and I'm focusing today here really on the air pollution, and I think Dr. Osborne jelks will get into some of the other, uh, other potential uh, risks that we have, is that Georgia is home to three of the nation's largest, dirtiest coal plants. And this in particularly affects people that are the most vulnerable to pollutants, such as children, the unborn, pregnant women, those who are trying to become pregnant, um, and anyone who's living and working around coal burning power plants. And there's a whole body of evidence around heavy metals from coal ash exposure that contaminate our air and contaminate our water. Here's another big one. I think as anyone that drops their child off at the bus stop and sees this plume of black smoke behind the school bus that's carrying their children away um, can attest to the, the concern that when you see this, but we know that diesel is carcinogenic um, and the burning diesel causes a whole host of other health effects like respiratory problems. Um, and we said certain cancers, um, can be due to exposure to the air pollution from burning diesel. And there is now newer evidence sort of linking cognitive difficulties in children as well. So beyond the pollution that comes in real time from burning the fossil fuels, um, we know that there are climate change risks from the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and these greenhouse gases cause health concerns in a variety of ways from hotter temperatures, from more intense and extreme weather events, and from rising sea levels that affect our coastal communities. So here's just a nice little infographic uh, developed by the CDC that helps us move from the climate impact to the environmental exposure, and then on to sort of, as we get farther out, to the effect on human health. So for example, things like rising temperatures can cause more air pollution, which will then cause impacts in terms of increased asthma exacerbations um, and worsened heart disease. Um, this is a nice map that sort of breaks down some of the impacts by geographic regions. So as we can see here in, uh, in the southeast, the anticipation is that we will see more extreme temperatures, worse outdoor air quality, 
potentially more exposure to mosquito and tick vectors for disease, so infectious diseases, concerns about flooding, coastal flooding, mental health impacts, and contaminated water. And I would add into that absolutely a risk for forest fires as well in, in our region. So here's one way that we can, as we communicate with others about the risks, and we want to sort of help bring them from the risks of climate change and kind of connect the dots for people to get to the actual health effects that are affecting us, our families, and our children. So if we think about a climate driver, like increased precip precipitation, so it's going to rain more frequently. Well, what that can lead to is more, ev more episodes of flooding, and then that can become an environmental hazard because that can lead to contaminated water. And then the ultimate health effect of that is an increased risk for waterborne infections that we, that we can see. So I kind of like to just take you through a couple of scenarios to help connect the dots um, as we think about health impacts. So this poor little sad child is my middle kid who about, I would say for a good three weeks or so looked like this. Um, the end of March into April. So her eyes were constantly swollen um, and she just never slept. So how, so if we had to kind of think about connecting the dots, this is all because of higher concentrations of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. So how did we get to this little sad face from higher carbon dioxide levels? So if we go down that chain, um, we know that higher carbon dioxide levels, though it is horrible in terms of climate change. It, there are some things that actually like higher carbon dioxide and th there are certain plants, certain weeds, um, certain pollen producing trees that really like um, this increase in carbon dioxide because it ends up helping them produce more pollen. So when we have that, we end up getting to more exposures to that pollen. And then the ultimate health effect is that we look like this for longer periods of time. Our allergy season um, that we used to anticipate is now growing longer. So because spring starts earlier and um, this can go on for months, um, frost doesn't come until much later, we can see repeated bouts of these aeroallergens affecting us. So that's one way of connecting the dots. And then if you go down even farther downstream, now people have to take medicines for longer and you know what are the potential long-term effects of that if you look at the the inserts on these medications it says if you need to take these medicines for more than two months talk to your health professional well since allergy season is growing longer we can we can anticipate that our children may be exposed to these drugs for longer periods of time so what is what are the health effects of that connecting the dots from higher temperatures to air pollution. So there are various air pollutants, um, but two that we really focus on and that we have really have well described health impacts are the particulate matter. So particularly PM 2.5 and then ozone, ground level ozone, which a lot of people know as smog. So we know that particulate matter can come from the combustion of fossil fuels, which then increases, then fossil fuels and greenhouse gases end up increasing temperatures. Um, with those increased temperatures, the, there are certain pollutants that are in the air that with that toxic stew, you add the heat from the higher temperatures and it creates more ground level ozone, which is almost like getting a sunburn on your lungs. So you breathe in this smog, this ozone, and it really irritates the lining of your lungs and can cause a lot of inflammation. So that is a, sort of a direct connecting the dots from higher temperature to worse air pollution, to then having these impacts on children and pregnant women. So effects on lung growth, lung function, uh, mental development, behavioral disorders, and even before you're born, 
um, starting with the lower birth weight, potential premature births, which have their own long-term effects, some risks for higher childhood cancers, and certainly for elderly people and those that have coronary artery disease, higher risk for stroke, heart attack. And one of the things that we really need to think about is this correlation with COVID. So now that the world is starting to open up and we're kind of really realizing the importance of being outdoors and how um, helpful that has been to a lot of our mental health to then be stuck back inside because of a poor, a poor air quality days, um, which will happen more frequently as temperatures rise is really something that can significantly act, um, affect our ability to do physical activity, to play sports outdoors, and then to also um, bolster our mental health. Connecting the dots from higher temperatures to these really beautiful looking um, insects. So again, plants, certain plants, weeds like higher CO2 levels and so do mosquitoes. So things that are not necessarily beneficial for humans seem to really love um, higher CO2 levels and higher temperatures. So what we see is that um, vectors like mosquitoes and ticks are really able to expand their territory and find new habitats um, because of warmer temperatures, disturbed rain patterns, um, which really can alter habitats. So for the first time in 2016, 2017, we saw actual spread of Zika in the continental US, in Florida and in Texas. Um, so these mosquitoes are able to find new habitats and then spread diseases to places that haven't necessarily seen them endemic to those areas. So things like Zika, there's concern about dengue fever, um, also the spread of Lyme disease throughout the United States. And then connecting the dots to mental health. So there's a variety of reasons that increase temperatures, increased uh, uh, frequency of extreme weather events, all of these things, um, and then flooding of coastal communities, all of these climate drivers can have an impact on mental health. Um, first from things like just anxiety, eco-anxiety, which I believe we already had a, a talk about, um, but then also P folks suffering from PTSD who have actually been impacted or lived through these extreme weather events. Um, and then a lot of evidence is now showing that just increased temperatures can cause more violent behavior um, and disruptions in mental health. So I will stop there with regard to talking about the health impacts and I'll pass it over uh, to Nataki. Thank you so much. So now I would like to uh, drill down just a little bit um, and sort of add to the um, to the to the knowledge that we've now gained um, and talk about the way that climate change impacts um, vulnerable populations in particular. Next slide, please. So I'll start first um, in talking about um, climate, the top climate hazards that we expect to experience. Um, in the Atlanta area. Um, in this workshop, we're talking about Georgia. Um, I live in Atlanta, and so I wanted to focus a little bit on some of the challenges in urban areas. Um, and, and keep in mind that um, there are likely different um, types of hazards that we might expect in uh, coastal areas, and it just depends on the location um, with respect to the, the top climate hazards. Um, so in terms of the year 2050, um, you can see a sort of a comparison here between uh, current issues and um, and those uh, what we expect to see in 2050. And so modeling tells us that we definitely expect to see precipitation intense or uh, more intense precipitation as um, a climate hazard um, in 2050. Um, we expect to see more warming. Um, and, and in particular, as we talk about urban areas, we've got to think about the urban heat island effect. 
Um, we expect to see things like drought and water deficit, um, as well as heat waves. Um, there are other hazards that we could, you know, talk about as well that may not be sort of the top ones, but um, these are also things that we might experience in places like Atlanta and in other parts of the state. Next slide, please. So as, as already been mentioned, um, we have, we're having more warm spring days. Um, in this graph here, you see the difference between 1970 and 2020. Um, so over this essentially 50 year time period, now we're seeing um, a, a close to 20 more days um, of spring in terms of having days above normal in terms of those spring temperatures. Um, next slide. When we have those um, increased days of, of spring, we have a longer growing season in terms of a longer allergy season, um, which we just got a great example and illustration of. Um, so here, looking at the difference between 1970 and 2020, we're seeing about 31 more days um, that would sort of constitute um, that longer growing season. Um, if you, you know, like I do, know people who are allergic to pollen, um, then this is something that um, definitely impacts folks um, in, in a very noticeable way. Next slide, please. So here, um, we're looking at the number of days above 90 degrees. Um, and so this data is from 1970 until 2018. Um, so already we're kind of at 22.1 more days um, that are above 90 degrees. I was actually in another workshop earlier and with some researchers from Georgia Tech, we're actually doing some projections um, in terms of um, between now and 2050 um, and the number of days that we expect to see over 100 degrees. Um, and and that was actually very significant. So as we begin to talk about um, higher temperatures, then we've got to be concerned about the effects that come as a result of exposure to extreme heat. And we have to start thinking about those populations that are going to be most vulnerable. Next slide, please. So as was already mentioned, we you know, have gotten um, a great overview of some of the health effects. And so this is um, really just, um, just you know, re-emphasizing what has been said. Um, when we think about climate change and climate change drivers, um, human exposures, um, we're thinking about health effects that might be direct and or indirect. Um, so things like temperature related illness and death, extreme weather related health effects, um, air pollution related health effects, um, food and waterborne diseases, um, vector and rodent borne diseases, um, the effects of food and water shortages as well as the effects of population displacement. Um, when we think about um, you know, those communities that have been impacted um, by intense floods and storms. Um, when we think about the Gulf Coast region in particular, we think about South Georgia, um, Alabama, you name it, um, people have gotten displaced from their homes as a result of some of the extreme weather events that we have experienced over the last several years. Next slide, please. And as we talk about climate change and vulnerability, um, it is important um, to realize that um, climate change is impacting all of us. It is real. Um, we are all in the same storm, meaning um, that we can't really get away from these climate change, uh, the effects of climate change. Um, but even though we're all in the same storm, we are not in the same boat. Certain communities are more vulnerable than others. And what I'd like to really emphasize here is that um, we don't necessarily have a situation where um, you know some populations are just inherently vulnerable. And we can we can talk about you know kind of our um, common vulnerable populations. You know. Um, children, the elderly, pregnant, the, the unborn. And so we kind of think about those populations as our typical vulnerable populations when we think about environmental health issues on a broad scale. But as we think about climate change and some of the drivers of it, when I talk about vulnerable um, populations or communities, I'm talking about those communities and populations that have been made to be more vulnerable in many cases because of systemic racism, because of policies that impact um, conditions that people might experience in their neighborhoods that impact things like the social determinants of health, whether or not people have access to um, financial resources, quality education, um, access to health care, and other things that impact health status. Next slide, please. 
So in this slide, um, I wanna talk a little bit about exposure, sens sensitivity, and ability to, to adapt. Um, and so as we talk about, um, as we talk about um, exposure, we're talking about contact between a person and one or more biological, um, psychosocial or chemical or physical stressor. Um, so these include stressors affected by climate change. You know, we could talk about um, physical uh, or chemical stressors, i.e. pollution, air pollution, um, physical stressors in terms of flooding. Um, we can talk about biological stressors in terms of vectors and rodents that carry disease. When we talk about sensitivity, we're talking about the degree to which people or communities are affected um, either adversely or even beneficially by their exposure to climate variability or to climate change. And then when we talk about the ability to, to adapt, um, we're talking about the adaptive capacity um, and ability of communities, institutions, or people um, to adjust to the potential hazards um, such as climate change and to take advantage of opportunities to respond um, to those consequences. The sad impact, the sad um, fact, excuse me, uh, about climate change um, is that it has a, multiply, a multiplier effect. Um, as we think about sensitivity, as we think about which populations are more vulnerable. And many studies show that communities of color and low income populations are hit first and worst um, by climate change. Um, the other sad fact um, is that these same populations that are hit first and worst are the populations that contribute the least to climate change. Um, so we're talking insult to injury. And as we think about that vulnerability um, of human health to climate change, we have to look at the health outcomes, um, inclusive of things like injury, acute and or chronic illnesses, including mental illness, mental health, and stress-related illnesses, um, developmental issues, and even death. Next slide, please. With respect to climate drivers, um, this, this slide kind of shares a couple of examples. Um, when we think about those exposure pathways um, and then look both at health impacts and health outcomes. Um, so as we think about the exposure, the contact um, that humans have with different factors or conditions or stressors, um, we can include some of these, under, these um, social determinants of health, things that contribute to a lot of the underlying health conditions that we see in communities. Um, as was already mentioned, um, COVID-19 has um, sort of put a spotlight on some of those underlying health conditions, and we have seen the disparities with respect to COVID-19 in terms of um, cases, um, hospitalizations, and deaths, particularly in, in Black and Brown communities, and we see those hospitalizations and deaths um, happening at much higher rates. Um, we see severity um, of COVID-19 um, disease in terms of how people are able to, um, to, to, you know, how people are suffering from the disease, the disease and how um, it has ended up in death um, for, you know, um, hundreds of thousands of people in the United States, um, and of course, millions around the world. Um, when we think about things like exposure to poverty um, and racial discrimination, um, exposure to these pathways, in addition to um, being exposed to cl climate drivers, yields people in poor neighborhoods um, generally being more likely to be exposed to climate change health effects. Um, when we think about the sensitivity, we're thinking about things like these underlying health conditions, we're thinking about health disparities. Um, and as we look at those health impacts, we see that people with chronic medical conditions are more likely to have a serious health problem during, say, a heat wave, for example, than healthier people. Um, when we think about that adaptive capacity, the ability of communities to respond um, to climate change and to adapt, um, we know um, that communities that have already been made to be vulnerable are less able to adapt or less able to um, to you know, kind of turn back um, or return back to kind of status quo after they experiences, experience shocks and stresses because of exposure to the effects of climate change. Um, and so people with reduced access to, to healthcare um, and preventive services are more likely to have severe health outcomes from their illness than those who don't. Next slide. <clears throat> 
so now I'd like to talk about um, kind of three specific examples um, as we think about the impacts of climate change. So I'll first start talking, first start off talking about climate change, air quality and health. Um, and we've already gotten a little bit of background here. Um, but what I'd like to um, just sort of um, maybe put a finer point on um, is the connection between climate change, air quality, um, and the way that it impacts vulnerable populations. Next slide, please. As we think about increased temperature, um, we're in you know late spring. We're headed towards summer right now. Um, you know, right now we, you know, um, are beginning to have the warmer days. Um, they're going to be sticking around for a while. And so with increased temperature and increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, this leads to an increase in formation of ground level ozone and that photochemical smog that was already discussed. Um, so we're talking about increased allergen production, um, i.e. pollen, um, and, you know, the impacts to people who are sensitive to it. Um, also longer seasons for allergy producing weeds. Also, we're, we're talking now about health effects of high levels of ozone exposure, which include things like reduced lung function, respiratory discomfort, and the exacerbation of chronic respiratory illness. And as we think about those populations that are going to be most vulnerable, um, we have to think about our senior citizens, children, um, people who already suffer from respiratory and chronic diseases, um, people who recreate or play outside, as well as people who work in the outdoors. These are the folks who are going to be most vulnerable to high levels of ozone, um, as well as increased allergens um, in our atmosphere. Next slide. So now let's talk just a little bit about extreme heat. Um, and because I live in the city of Atlanta, um, we've got to think about the urban heat island effect. Um, here you see an urban heat island profile, and you see in areas that are rural, maybe less developed, um, you see that the risk is, is lower. Um, and as we move into kind of residential and suburban areas, commercial um, areas, um, as we think about downtown areas, places that you know have a lot of asphalt um, and concrete, um, we're thinking about much higher temperatures. And so um, as we think about those effects of, or, uh, of um, of heat um, vulnerability and uh, urban heat, um, we've got to also think about those populations who are gonna be most vulnerable. And in many cases, we're talking about some of the same vulnerable populations that have just been mentioned. Next slide. So in terms of um, heat waves, um, and we do expect warming to be one of those uh, top climate hazards um, by the year 2050 that we experience in places like Atlanta and in other parts of the state of Georgia. We're talking about the greatest risk for people who do not have access to air conditioning. Um, and in some cases, maybe people have some access to air conditioning. Maybe it's not central air, um, but they, there may be you know, kind of window units in um, particular rooms. Um, but the whole, you know, the whole home may not um, be cooled. Um, there are some people who may not be able to afford air conditioning or to afford those retrofits that would give them sort of central air. Um, and then in some populations, people just may be accustomed, um, may be unaccustomed to heat waves. Um, they might have air conditioning, but choose, may choose not to use it, um, not really realizing the danger. Um, and we've got to think about, um, you know, um, seniors, people who may be on fixed income, um, those who are, you know, even the working poor who might be trying to save money, um, you know, by um, maybe raising windows, using fans, trying to do anything but to turn on the air conditioning. Um, and in some cases, that has proved to be deadly um, when those temperatures get to be very high. Um, so again, the elderly, um, we're talking, um, you know, low socioeconomic status populations, um, those with heart problems, um, asthma, the very young, uh, even the homeless are going to be very vulnerable to extreme heat. I will say that in some cities, um, there have been studies conducted to show that areas that have been historically redlined tend to be the areas where we see um, most of the heat, um, most of the extreme heat and extreme temperatures. Um, I've recently helped to launch a project um, in Atlanta that 
is a partnership between Spelman College, the Environmental and Health Sciences Program, um, where I teach, um, the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance, um, a community-based organization that I helped to co-found, um, the Georgia Institute of Technology, Partnership for Southern Equity, um, Harambe House and Citizens for Environmental Justice in Savannah, Georgia, and a couple of other groups, including the city of Atlanta. And so we're going to be looking at uh, urban heat um, in the city of Atlanta and in surrounding locales um, to try to get some understanding of where there is greatest um, variability in terms of extreme heat um, and we want to understand which populations in the Atlanta region are most at risk. Next slide, please. So as we think about other um, climate, um, climate impacts, we have to think about things like flooding, uh, urban flooding, coastal flooding. These are all things that have already and will continue to impact um, different cities, um, towns, and areas within the state of Georgia. Next slide. As we think about some of the health effects that are associated um, with um, urban and coastal flooding, they are both short-term and long-term effects. Um, on a short-term basis, we can think about things like injuries, exposure to disease-causing pathogens, um, exposure to mold, if we think about homes that might be inundated with floodwaters, um, and possibly um, exposure to other toxic pollutants. Unfortunately, in places like the west side of Atlanta, um, when we see flooding events, we also see um, people's homes getting flooded out with raw untreated sewage mixed with stormwater, creating sort of a toxic mix um, in, in homes um, that can expose people to those disease-causing pathogens um, that can um, lead to exposure to mold and mildew, um, and also things like loss of property and displacement um, in terms of, you know, having to move away from those homes. When we talk about excessive rainfall, that facilitates entry of human sewage and uh, animal waste into waterways, as well as drinking water supplies. Um, this can increase the risk of waterborne diseases. This is why when there are flooding events or even when there's something like a water main break, um, we might you know, get um, guidance to boil your water before you use it. Um, that's because of the potential risk um, of human sewage and other waste um, getting into our drinking water supply. Longer term effects, and we can definitely think about um, our coastal areas, our rural areas. Um, we have to think about things like crop loss. So while we look at drought on one hand, we can also look at excess water um, and how that contributes to the loss of crops. Um, and then also mental health effects from the stress um, of experiencing flood related events. Um, we could even talk about um, extreme weather related events. But in terms of those flood related events, um, when people you know lose their property, um, in end up perhaps losing their homes, being displaced, having to move. These are trauma. Um, there's trauma associated with these experiences. Um, and we hold that trauma in our bodies. It's not something that's short term. Um, we're talking a long term proposition. Next slide. And so as we talk about these communities that are most vulnerable, um, I mentioned just a few minutes ago that certain populations have been made to be more vulnerable um, in terms of systemic racism and how that racism um, translates into racialized policies um, that have dictated and shaped where people live, um, like some of those red line communities in other cities around the country where we see um, those red line communities being the places where people are suffering from heat stress um, and vulnerability. Um, but what we also have to look at is who lives next to um, where toxic and hazardous waste is being produced. And I wanted to lift up um, a couple of studies. These are older studies, but kind of landmark or seminal studies in the field of environmental justice um, that bring all of these factors together. Um, and it's fitting that we're talking about um, kind of eco-faith you know, at home. Um, the United Church of Christ um, had a commission on racial justice and equality that in 1987 released the landmark study Toxic Waste and Race in the United States, um, which presented the first set of cross-sectional studies that illustrated an association between population demographics and the location of commercial um, hazardous waste facilities, as well as uncontrolled toxic waste sites in the United States. 
Um, in this study, race was found to be the predominant factor um, that predicts where you see toxic and hazardous waste. They looked at other factors, including income level. A lot of times people will say, well, isn't it about income level? Um, is it about, you know, isn't, aren't these facilities um, placed in, in places where the land is the cheapest? And while that may be the case, um, race was found to be the predominant factor, even over income level. But I have to also mention that because of that systemic racism, um, you know, and how uh, advantage has been unfairly shaped for some in this country and unfairly shaped for others in this country, we see, I call, you know, race and income level in the United States, kids and cousins. They are so closely correlated um, because of the impacts of racism in this society. Um, so here, again, race was found to be that predominant factor. Then in 2007, another study called Toxic Waste and Race at 20 revealed that race continues to be the predominant factor that predicts the location of hazardous waste facilities in the United States. And not only that, um, that you know, race, uh, racial disparities that existed um, were even greater than in previous years. Um, there have been other studies conducted that since this time, none that I've seen at a national scale but definitely some, you know, regionally. And what we've seen is that um, this, this, this fi the finding of both of these studies still rings to be true, um, that race is still that factor. And unfortunately, um, other studies are also showing us um, that the zip code um, is now um, sort of a leading predictor of future um, health, wealth, and, um, you know, things like economic mobility. So where you live um, and what you may be exposed to where you live um, impacts your health in a detrimental way. Next slide. And so as we talk about where we live, um, let's talk about, you know, Georgia just a little bit. Um, there is a, a, a hip hop group you know, called um, the Goody Mob that had a song in the 1990s called The Dirty South. And so when I think about um, the, the Black Belt region, when I think about Georgia, um, and when we look at where um, communities of color are concentrated in the United States, it's in the South and Southeast, um, in the Deep South and Southeast. And this is where we also see a number of toxic and hazardous waste facilities. Next slide, please. Dr. Robert Bullard, who is known as the father of the environmental justice movement, says that the South has a legacy of unequal protection. Why would the environment be any different? Um, and so that rings true in a number of studies, um, including, next slide, um, one study that I'd like to spotlight. It's several years old now. This was a study that was released in 2012 um, called The Patterns of Pollution, a report on demographics and pollution in metropolitan Atlanta. Next slide. In this study, um, the authors of the study um, looked at a 15 county, excuse me, a 14 county um, metropolitan Atlanta region. And you'll see some familiar counties here, Fulton County, DeKalb County, um, Cobb, um, Fayette, Clayton, um, you name it. And so here um, they found that metropolitan Atlanta in these 14 counties has 52 environmental justice hotspots. So the hotspots are all of the blocks that are in red that have a number on them. So they're numbered in terms of the intensity of of the hazard. These hotspots are locations where you have multiple pollution sources. So more than one pollution source. So um, there could be facilities that are releasing, releasing pollutants to the air, maybe some that are releasing pollutants to water. Uh, we, we can't you know, figure that out from um, this part of the data. Um, but what you need to know is that these are communities that are impacted by multiple pollution sources and that there's also some level of social um, vulnerability. So we're talking about um, um, low-income communities, uh, communities of color, and e even language-isolated communities. Um, number one, the number one and number four hotspots are actually um, located in West Atlanta, not too far from where I live, um, and they're, they're also located in Fulton County. The cold spots, and I saw that question just pop up, are the blue boxes. They're not numbered, um, but the cold spots are places where you might have multiple pollution sources, but you don't have the same type of social vulnerability in terms of the populations. So as we think about those populations that are hit first and worst by climate change, as we think 
think about um, the ability of, of communities to respond and to adapt to exposure to pollutants, to climate change, we're now talking about in the cold spot communities, um, areas that have a better uh, opportunity to respond, um, low, higher income, you know, communities, uh, in some cases, you know, um, perhaps with uh, some, you know, financial um, capabilities um, to to um, challenge polluters, um, you know, to challenge City Hall. And it's not that you don't see, um, you know, kind of that on the ground activism happening in other populations, but we find um, that communities of color and in many cases, low income populations just end up being marginalized. Um, and, and studies have shown um, dating back to the year of 1992, um, that even at the federal level, um, and while we've seen some changes happening back then, even at the federal level, a national a law journal study found that as EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency was dealing with issues of pollution in different communities across the country, uh, if you were in a white community, um, then people saw faster action and stiffer penalties for those polluters than if you lived in a black or brown community. Slower action, um, slower, um, you know, um, less stringent, you know, um, penalties, and maybe in some cases, you know, no penalties at all. Next slide. So in terms of you know, some of the other key findings of this patterns of pollution report, um, they found that areas with a people of color population of 80% or higher had more than double the number of pollution sources um, than areas where people of color made up less than 10% of the population. Um, households in which English was not the primary language. Um, these, again, these language isolated communities um, more, are more than twice as likely to live in high pollution areas. And then areas with poverty levels above 20% contain on average almost six pollution sources compared to areas with poverty rates under 5% that only have two. So here you see those disparities, you see the differences based on where people live, based on the types of um, types of populations that people are part of in terms of um, racial and ethnic identities. Next slide, please. Um, and so as we talk about on the ground action to address these issues, um, many communities um, have called for environmental justice. This right to a safe, decent quality of life for all people, um, regardless of race, ethnicity, uh, income or culture um, in the environments where we live, work, play, worship and learn. Um, very important um, in terms of um, the way that communities of color have chosen to address um, and to deal with um, exposure, the disproportionate exposure that we face to environmental toxicants and pollutants, as well as to the effects of climate change. Um, and then my last slide, um, next slide is to just just to, to bring in this topic of climate justice. Um, and we consider climate justice to be um, a part a, or a form of environmental justice. And climate justice really calls for us to address the root causes um, you know, of um, the vulnerabilities that we see in our communities. Again, addressing um, you know, um, the, the use of fossil fuels, our over-dependence on fossil fuels, um, but also, you know, addressing the root causes of a lot of the inequities that we see um, and experience in our society. Um, these inequities that lead to these unequal burdens that communities of color um, and low-income uh, populations tend to face. And so if we can address um, you know, climate change from the perspective of the pollution um, that we generate, you know, the fossil fuels that we burn um, and the other drivers of climate, then we can see these co-benefits. Not only will we improve environmental quality, um, we will also improve um, health for everyone, but in particular, um, we can see some huge gains in terms of populations that have already been made to be more vulnerable um, because of climate change and because of the impact impacts of uh, institutionalized racism in this country. Next slide, and I will pass it back over. Thank you so much. That was so, just so powerful and so informative. Thank you. So I think that um, we're going to just kind of close up with just kind of the some hope. So we're going to start, we're going to think about some hopeful messages coming from this. So we have 
the tools for most of the solutions at this point. And that's really what Drawdown Georgia is focused on really expressing to all of us as Georgians. There are many things that we can do and they've highlighted several solutions. So if, among them are shifting away from fossil fuels to renewables and other zero carbon energy sources, cutting emissions from agriculture, moving toward more plant-based diets, um, really focusing on energy efficiency measures, changing farm practices, which are particularly important in Georgia as, a, as an agricultural state um, in many regions of our state, decarbonizing industry, um, really thinking about creating zero carbon transport, and then focusing on a circular economy. So a lot of these solutions are there. Um, so we wanted to spend the, the last bit of time talking about Draw down Georgia's 20 achievable goals. So I won't go through all of these, but you will have access to these slides and be able to, to look at this a little bit later. Um, but there are 20 solutions um, that um, academics and scientists and community leaders sort of honed in on um, as part of Drawdown Georgia that are achievable. So this is not really pie in the sky you know, everything would have to go perfectly. This was really thinking about what is achievable based on what we're already doing right now. So um, one of the really interesting things that Drawdown Georgia did um, was to commission a survey to, in um, July of 2020 while we were really in the throes of the COVID crisis um, to gain a deeper understanding of what, how Georgians are feeling about climate change and sustainability and the perceptions um, around climate change um, and understand how COVID-19 shifted um, these attitudes. Um, and then really they looked at determining if Georgians saw a link between climate and social justice issues. So the first step really was to see, the first step in any change is to really see if we can agree that there is a problem we need to work on. Um, and the major takeaways from their survey um, was that COVID-19 and all that we have been through with this crisis has had an impact on how we think about as Georgians what um, actions we need to take to curb climate change. Um, and Georgians are worried about climate change and are interested in solutions. Um, some of the major drivers that um, we are focusing on are solar farms, protecting our forests and coastal wetlands. Um, and we all, a lot of us agree that we will vote with our feet and really purchase and our purchasing power um, and nonprofit community engagement to move toward these, these actions. Um, and that we believe that climate change and social justice are intertwined issues. Um, so I'm not gonna spend too much time because I think we really do wanna have some time for questions at the end, but as you can see that we have, um, we have a large percentage of people in Georgia that believe that climate change and global warming matter, and they want to make a change in their own personal behavior um, to affect change. Um, and Georgians also agree um, that global warming will harm us as well as future generations. So we can see the top box among, uh, for Georgians understanding that it will harm, climate change will harm future generations at 70%. 55% um, believe that it will harm us personally. And this is really jumps up to 77 when we look at college students. And then once we agree that there's a problem, the second step to any sort of change, behavior change is to start learning about solutions. And in general, we are familiar with some of the solutions that have been um, presented as effectively combating, mitigating climate change. So electric vehicles, rooftop solar, um, reducing food waste. We have quite a bit of knowledge about some of the largest solutions that are available to us. Um, though we know a lot, many Georgians, the one solution that they were really interested in learning the most about was reduced 
food waste. And I think this is important for us to know so that as we tailor our messages to our local community settings to affect change, we're really seeing where are we in our perceptions um, and what are the things that we can really sort of focus on where people are already looking to change their behavior or already wanting to learn more about. Um, and then the third step, obviously, this is very abbreviated and doesn't quite go through the entire shift in mental models, but we really need to then start taking action to change. And what we're seeing is people are taking action. So 55% of Georgians are um, currently practicing new activities um, that are climate friendly, 32% eating and cooking more with seasonal foods, pe people focused on less creating less food waste, and um, family is growing more vegetables at home or in their communities. Um, and then this is really kind of getting at people also saying that they are going to be voting um, in order to ensure that these solutions are foremost in the mind um, of our leaders, our policymakers, and also we will be using our purchasing power to make sure that the products we buy um, are invested in things like protecting forests, reducing food waste, and optimizing or thinking about solar. So what we did here was we just sort of highlighted some of the things that we, on an individual level, can, can start doing today or tomorrow um, that will really have an impact um, in terms of really focused on the, draw, the Drawdown Georgia solutions. Um, and, and I'd like to just end with kind of thinking about just one change. So if we were to think about just one change to kind of show the parallels with protecting planetary health, mitigating climate change, and also protecting human health. So thinking about just what a lot of people will, will, are starting to do is meatless Mondays. So this is not going vegan, this is not becoming a vegetarian, but this is just swapping meat out one day a week for plant forward nutritious food. That's the key as a vegetarian that lives on French fries, that is not a healthy diet. So that is not what I'm suggesting. It's really whole food plant-based that is filled with Nutri nutrients, vitamins, minerals. So we're talking veggies, beans, nuts, legumes. Um, so the planetary benefits, and I tr we tried to make this interesting for skipping meat one day a week, we could save an estimated 100 billion gallons of water if we all did this as Americans, um, save approximately 70 million gallons of gas, uh, 3 million acres of land, which is about twice the size of Delaware, and then reduce um, greenhouse gases. And we're, we, we know that, I just thought of some, tried to find something kind of cute. So 10 billion charged smartphones, um, that, that would be the amount of greenhouse gas equivalent that we would lower in terms of emissions. And then on the other side, the health benefits. So we really would see from this shift, um, people, as people move toward a plant forward diet, improvements in skin health, in digestive health, health, gut health, our microbiome, so the gut bacteria, energy levels in our immune system, especially around things like COVID and these infectious diseases, very important. And then the long-term health benefits of making a change like that is decreasing chronic diseases like obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and improving kidney and bone health. So that's just from, from one change that we could make tomorrow.